Try to finish this up. Get a drink of that good water tonight. Amen. Psalm chapter number 69. When we finish this up, then we're going to start on Psalms 119. Uh, that's going to be a long, really long message, so you just come ready that night. I've got to preach on 176 verses and 22 stanzas with eight verses to each one of them, and then give you a two and a half hour introduction. So it's, we're going to have fun that night, amen. But anyway, good to be in God's house tonight. I thank the Lord. Hey, thank the Lord for your Bible. You'd be surprised how many countries around the world, they don't have one tonight. If they have a page of the Word of God, they do well. And by the way, they, if they have a page of the Word of God, they, they hold it as precious. They hold that thing as precious. Started here last week, this, uh, there's 36 verses in here, so I had to break it down. But it's actually in two sections. Uh, we dealt last week uh, with life sorrows in verses actually 1 through 15. And I keep driving this thing home, and I believe the farther we get down the road, the more problematic uh, living is going to become, not just uh, spiritually, but physically, financially, and about every way. Uh, life is hard, and, and we find here that King David, a man after God's own heart, he wrote this uh, particular psalm. Uh, God sure let him go through the wars. Uh, let me tell you, he, he had to fight for every inch, for everything he ever had, even as a small uh, or a young man, not a small man. You know, sometimes we think of David as a little bitty short, ruddy guy, uh, but when he tried on Saul's armor, Saul was probably about seven feet tall. He was head and shoulders above everybody. He tried on his metal, his armor, and everything he had, and he put it off, not because it was too big, he put it off because he hadn't proved it. I've often thought that he went back and got Goliath's sword. He said, there's none like it. No, no telling the size of that sword, and he was man enough to swing that thing. But God let him suffer throughout his life. But then we find that the Lord Jesus suffered through his public life. So I just got it figured this way. If David can suffer and the Lord can suffer, I believe me and you will do all right. We can suffer a little bit with it. Go over to First Peter. I'm not going to run over there, but I want to read a little bit. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, what is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is not what you see Faith is something that has substance. This has substance. Our faith is not baseless. We've got a basis for our faith. So it's not baseless. It's a substance, but it can't be seen, and it's an evidence. Why? Our faith works, and it produces outward evidence. But this is what he said. Through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. He said, you're in heaviness through many manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, who having not seen you love. Now we love him tonight. I've never seen him, you've never seen him, nobody living's ever seen him. Sometimes you see people say they saw, what, 700 foot Jesus or what? Listen, I don't pay any attention to that mess. I just move on. Uh, no man has seen him in our lifetime. But it said, though now, you, though you see him not, yet believing. So we often lose sight of the Lord in our dark and seemingly endless times I've often said I don't mind waiting. I do not like open-ended open -ended waiting. I like to have, you know, if I know I've got to wait two weeks or whatever, they've been, Barbara put stuff on top of my head for four weeks. I got that behind me. Now I've got a week behind me of just scratching it, all right? And it's just, I, I call it chemo. It takes these little precancers off, but before you know it, it's over with. I can wait four weeks. They told me to do it in January. I told Barbara, we're getting this thing over with. 
uh, by Christmas time, we're going to get over and we're going to get done. So if you see all those red, red places and everything on top of my head, they'll go away shortly. But I don't mind that type of waiting. But I hate to wait on something not knowing if or when it's going to uh, transpire. I don't like that type of waiting tonight. So what I want to deal with tonight, life's sorrows are real, but he gives us in this psalm solutions that we're to live by while we're going through problems. I believe there's a way to handle your problems and there's a way not to handle your problems. Uh, some people go off the deep end, they can't stand pressure or whatever, and I believe there's a way to handle your problems. I'm not Superman, but I take my, th my things to the Lord, and I just give them to the Lord and I tell Him I need help in order to get me through where I'm, where I'm at. I thought about this in verse 16 through 36, that we know, hey, we're still under the control of God tonight. There are some verses that you and I understand they are easily quoted, hard, hard to live. So I'm going to read them to you real quick. One, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I believe everybody here could probably uh, quote those verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we find that he told us, when you can't track him, you've just got to learn to trust him. Learn to trust him. Paul said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I'm in to be there with content. He had to learn that contentment. The other one that's sometimes hard to understand is Romans 8.28. We were in chapter 8 of Romans uh, this morning. But he said, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. These verses are right. Sometimes they're hard to swallow. I'm careful how I quote verses like this to people going through great trials. Now, when the door opens to give it to them, but when somebody's lost a loved one, I don't quote Romans 8.28 to them. Uh, I, I let God do the quoting of that. That's why it's good. Listen, memorize Scripture, and when you need it, it'll be there. If you, hey, that, the Word of God will not come back void. You memorize the Word of God, and when you memorize the Word of God, when you need the Word of God, the Word of God will come back. Now, an old preacher, I, often I quote him, uh, he said, don't mess with God's toys. Now, I don't say that irreverently tonight, but I do say this, the secret things belong to God. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. If we're in a mess today, we don't know if it's going to be reconciled necessarily tomorrow or the next day or the next week or next month. And sometimes we've just got to go through them. So we, we saw life saws. I want to look at these verses. What do you do when you're in trouble? Verses 13 through 15. I'm going to actually back up a couple of verses. But look at verse 13 through 15, or read them real quick. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. I like to outline when I study. So I'm going to give you an outline for each one of these verses through here. But I find in verses 13 through 15, we have to learn to wait on God in prayer. Now, notice I said in prayer. You say, well, I'm waiting on God. We need to be prayerfully waiting on God. That's what he deals with. Verse 13, we find David continues in his problems to make supplication to God on a regular basis. I believe you ought to get up in prayer in the morning. You ought to go uh, to bed in prayer at night. I think it's a good thing that God's people pray. And I know you, a lot of people are busy, but make yourselves a prayer closet someplace. Just a place where you can sit down. If you have time, go over the prayer list. I found out it helps you when you pray for others. When somebody, you're in trouble, you pray for other people that are in trouble. But we find in verse number uh, 15, let me go back up here. This, 
iPad wanting to act up a little bit. Verse 13, we find he continues to make supplication to God. And then in verse 14, he places his trust in God's timing for the answer. Verse number 14, he just said in, in that verse, deliver me out of the mire. But he talked about, do it in your time, Lord. It's, it's not my time tonight, but I want you to do it in your time. I want you to do it in an acceptable time. Looking back, verse number 13. Sometimes we try to tell God to hurry up. <laughs> you, ever, you ever tell God to hurry up? Did God ever hurry up? Listen, you're not going to worry God tonight. God already knows the outcome of this thing. His, his hurry up doesn't work, all right? You can't push God into doing something if it's not His will and His time. So what He did in prayer was He bowed to the will of God in the time of answer. He didn't say, Lord, I need it now. He said, Lord, in an acceptable time. So we find that David continues to trust God's timing. And then in verse number 15, he pleads for God to let him not sink in the process, okay? He said, Lord, I don't know when you're going to answer, but don't let me go down for the third time. Don't let the waters overflow me, Lord, while, while I wait. Keep my head above water just a little bit, Lord. You know, sometimes you get in so much trouble, you think you're going to sink. But God's able to keep you floating. God's able to take care of you. I learned years ago, I, I was always a good swimmer. I, I was a qualified lifeguard. I enjoyed doing that. But most people uh, that don't like to, anybody here are not swimmers? I, I know Barbara's not. Listen, if she gets in water up to her knees, she is in dire straits. I mean, she's just scared to death of water. I try to get her out of there. You, hey, your body will float. You're buoyant. All you got to do is just bend down, touch your toes, you'll pop your back that far up out of the water. I tell people they drown because they panic. When you're in trouble, you got to trust God with His time, but ask God to help you to keep your head afloat at the same time. You've got to be able to do that in verses 13 through 15. Verses 16 through 18, we find He leans on the compassion of God. He said in verse number 16, he said, Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. So we find him appealing to the compassion of God. He recognizes something, verse number 16, that I think is important for all of us, that God is good all the time. God's good all the time. Listen, there's never a time when God's not good. God doesn't try to be good. God is good. God is love. God is... These are attributes of God. God's goodness is all the way there. It's when you're in trouble up to your neck, God is still good to you at that time. I think that's why he put 1 Thessalonians 5.18 in the Bible. And he just simply said that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we find the compassion of God needs to be recognized and the graciousness of God in our sinful times. Look in verse 17. Hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. We find that David had some issues sometime in his own life. What happens to us when we get in trouble and, and we, there seemingly there's no way out, sometimes we become more carnal than we do spiritual. We give up on the spiritual part. That doesn't seem to be working out too good for us. Sometimes in sinfulness, we take matters into our own hands. Uh, I've been known to do that. I was, uh, had, a, had a bad temper years ago. I was one of those guys, I'd just take it and take it and take it, and they didn't know I was boiling. And they found out I was boiling when the top blew off of the can, and they understood at that time. Hey, taking things in your own hand. We need to learn to do what we can, but not to take the situation in our own hands. 
but to trust God. God's a compassionate God tonight. God, in verse 18, David recognized the grace of God in the bad times. He said, draw unknit nine to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. So we find that he, one, learned to wait in prayer, and two, he leaned on the compassion of God in that time, knowing that even in your bad times, God loves you. God cares. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. That's why in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God cares for us and he cares what we're doing then we find in verses 19 through 21 in the hands of the enemies of God now notice we find in verse number 19 thou hast known my reproach my shame my dishonor mine adversaries are all before thee notice he didn't say all around me God sees people that try to hurt you God knows who they are. They're at your adversaries tonight. And I'm talking about in the right way. If you get mad and you cause something in your own life, sometimes you bear the recompense of it. But if you're guiltless in what's going on and you've just got people that are trying to wrong you in a wrong way, you need to understand God sees them just hey, better than you see them. So we find in the hands of enemies, David's enemies were defined. He called them adversaries. What's an adversary? It's a foe. It's an enemy, an antagonist, a rival. Uh, uh, rivals are just simply someone that stands against you. So we find that he defined who these individuals were. They were people that hated him and wanted him brought down. I believe David was one of the best kings, probably the best king that Israel ever had, even with his problems that he had. Some of them were man-made. But at the same time, he was a good man. I believe the man loved God and his adversaries hated him because of his power and his position, his possessions, everything that he had, they hated him for it. So we find that David's emptiness is declared in here in verse 20. He said, reproach hath broken my heart. You ever had a, anybody had a broken heart? Sometimes just have your heart crushed. Uh, people are talking about children. Let me get a sip of water. When children are young, they step on your toes. Sometimes when children get older, they step on your hearts. Uh, there's times when we are broken hearted. David said, reproach had broken my heart. He said, I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. I, and for comforters, but I found none. He looked around to see somebody that had pity on him, and nobody did. Nobody had pity on the man of God. So we find that his heart was broken, and he endured some terrible things. He said in verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat. By the way, this, this psalm is both practical and it's also prophetical. It's Davidic, but it's messianic at the same time. They did the same thing to the Lord. Look what he said. They gave me also gall for my meat. What's gall? Gall will burn your stomach up. Gall is like drinking straight vinegar or uh, you know they used to have this jogging in the jug thing going on you know I think it was grapefruit and then they had brown vinegar and they had two or three things and if you drank all that you was going to be back like it was 20 years ago I uh, didn't work out too good that little fad went away and I thank God for fixes that we have out here you know old people have some things that really work uh, before we had synthetic medications, they actually treated people. I had a man one time trying to put Barbara on a uh, brand new medicine, and, and he acted like the old medicines didn't work anymore. And I said, what happened to the old way? Did they not treat this before? So we found that in the hands of his enemies, he's sometimes bitter in his heart. Gall means to irritate, to make sore, or to burn something. We find in verses 23, uh, 22 through 28, David's desire concerning his enemies. Now, we're going to get into five or six verses here of what we call imprecatory praying. 
Precatory is actually a legal term. Counselor back there knows more about it than I do. But sometime when you will something to somebody or leave something, then you can put what's called a precatory within that thing as to how you want it to be used. That's, that's where it's used in a legal sense. And precatory means to pray against or to ask something against somebody. A lot of people have problems with imprecatory praying. They say, well, you're supposed to love your enemies. You are. You say, well, you're supposed to do good to your enemies. That's what the Bible says. But the Bible is full with imprecatory praying. Many of these psalms that we go through are going to be imprecatory psalms. And he does that in verses 20 through, three, uh, through, through verses number 28. So we find that it's not wrong for you to pray against somebody now normally imprecatory praying is prophetic by that I mean you're praying God this is what should happen according to what they're doing so you're not actually praying uh, the fire down on their head but actually you're doing something that I do often you're praying that the justice of God be done and I believe that the justice of God needs to be done. I've learned uh, in my short years, I, I don't want revenge on people. I never seek that. One thing I've tried to learn to do is love my enemies best I can. But at the same time, I do a lot of uh, imprecatory praying. I pray for the judgment of God, the justice of God, to be done in a right manner because sometimes you've got to have justice in this life. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, let their table become a snare in verse number 22. That means turn their bang banqueting into ruin. Just mess up their whole party, Lord. They're going to sit down at a big table and kind of like Belshazzar. Uh, boy, hey, they, they had a drunken uh, party that night. The Lord had already written on the wall, many, many tickle you fars. And he told them this night, hey, I'm going to require your life. And they were all drinking, and that night they took his life. So, hey, I don't want my enemies to banquet. I don't want them, and when I'm talking about not just eating at the table, I thank God that they get fed. But I don't believe if they're giving me a hard time that I don't believe that they need to be having a good time. That's what he's talking about in there. Notice what he said in verse number 22. Uh, verse number 23, Let their table become a snare unto them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. So he said in verse number 22, Let their table become a snare. In verse number 23, notice what he said, Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. He said the fear that they put upon me needs to be put back upon them. That's imprecatory praying. I believe that people ought to live right, they ought to do right. I try to help people out, but at the same time, I, sometimes they need to quake in fear under the hand of God. That sometimes is the only thing that will ever get them right. And that's what he's talking about in verse number 23. Notice verse number 24. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. He said, let their way be painful. Remove the joy of living from the ways that they are, from, from what they're doing. Listen, I'm just reading out of the Bible tonight. This is something that God put in there to give us some help. Sometimes you've got to pray in an imprecatory manner. I think it's right to do that. I don't think it's wicked to do that. Verses 25 and 26, he said, let their home be destroyed. Let them have no place to rest. I'm not talking about burning their house down with the kids in it. That's what I, I'm, I'm talking. You know what your home's supposed to be? I hope your home is a place of rest. Barbara and I, when we left, she said, boy, it's a pretty little house sitting down there. I said, it sure is. I'll be glad when I'm back in it. Not that I want the service over, but I'll be tickled to death tonight, pull back down the driveway, get out, open the door, go in. Too hot to light the fire tonight, so I guess we'll keep the air conditioning on for a little while. But peace and joy. Hey, he said, don't let their existence in their homes be a peaceful one. Sometimes in order for people to get right, they have to suffer some things to bring them to a point of repentance. I've, I've often thought about Hamas over there. 
nothing's going to wake that crowd up. I don't think anything will. Listen, that's been going on. Uh, hey, we were back in biblical times in Sunday school. That's an old thing going on over there. That was the land of the Philistines. We found this morning where they attacked Israel from behind and took prisoners. Does that sound like Gaza? Slipped across the border, did the same thing. Listen, I don't think that they need to have peace in their homes and enjoyment in what they're doing. I believe sin needs to have a recompense, and that's what he's talking about. He said, let their iniquity come upon them. Their sinful choices need to bring about spiritual consequences. Thank God they get them right. You know, I pray for Hamas to get saved. Christ died for every one of those people over there, folks, on both sides of that fence. But if they're not going to get saved and they're going to do what they're doing, then there needs to be a judgment so strong. I think the only way to handle the Middle East from Iran on down, now Korea's, North Korea's threatening us. I thought to myself, you ought to shoot their little satellite out of the sky. They put up a spy satellite so they can take pictures of what's going on. Hey, I thought, boy, Hey, let me get off of that. Amen. Let the home be destroyed to find no peace. Verse 27, let their iniquity come upon them. Their sinful choices have consequences. In verse 28, he said this, let their eternity be damned. Once you notice verse 28, it's important. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. It's he talking about one, a death sentence, but he declares on them what we call in the New Testament an anathema. An anathema is the judgment of God. The Bible said, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Anathema means to be cut off in his sin. Maranatha means that behold our Lord cometh in judgment. He's talking about the judgment of God upon these people. Listen, I hope they get saved, but how would you like to live next door in heaven to one of those people? You know, a lot of people think they'd like heaven. They, they wouldn't like heaven. I think a lot of people go to church won't like heaven. Heaven's going to be praise. It's going to be worship. It's going to be singing. It's going to be glorification. Hey, it's, go, it's going to be all about Jesus. Hey, we're going to have a time in heaven. They don't like church. I put on that sign out there one time, shame on me, if you don't like to go to church here, you, don't like, you wouldn't like heaven. And a woman wrote me a letter and said, I choose not to go to your church. That wasn't what I was saying. If you don't like to go to church somewhere in the county here or now, you're not going to like heaven. These people wouldn't like heaven. They would defile heaven. So if they're not going to get saved, then you let their end of the road be the judgment of God on sin for an eternity. You put them where they belong. You know, people go to hell because God has no choice. They leave him no choice in the matter. He gives them a choice. They can either come to him in repentance and faith and love God and the things of God, or they can hate the things of God and die in their sin, and then he has no choice in the matter. If you read over in the book of Matthew, hell was not even made for a man. If somebody goes to hell, they go to hell out of the will of God. That shoots Calvinism. He said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angel. Always been a verse that interested me in the book of either Isaiah or Ezekiel. I get Ezekiel, Ezekiel and Isaiah mixed up in their prophecy sometime uh, with, about Satan. But he said, he said to Lucifer that he would bring a fire out of Lucifer that would devour him. I've often wondered if the hatred of Lucifer did not fuel the fires of hell itself. But it is prepared for the devil and his angels. He said, if they're not going to get right here, let their eternity be damned. The ultimate anathema. If they will not stop and get right, they have no right to live in God's heaven with God's people. They have no right to do that. That's not cruel. That's just something that's biblical. Now, verses 30, 29 through 36, we find David's confidence in Jehovah is restored. Look in verse number 29. I'm poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. 
we find that his salvation is reassured. Not his salvation spiritually. I think David knew he was just as saved as you and I know that we're saved. And I believe the Old Testament saint had just as much assurance as you and I have assurance in our day. I believe God, hey, he dealt with them in the same manner he did to us. They looked forward to Christ in repentance and faith uh, in a sacrifice that was coming. We look back to it. I believe they had the same assurance that we've got. So I don't think he's talking about assurance of salvation. David knew that the Lord was his shepherd. But I think confidence in his salvation in that he would give him victory. He would give him deliverance. He, I believe he knew that God was going to set him back up on high. Look at verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. We'll magnify him with thanksgiving. Verse number 30, we find David's song returns. Hmm? You know, sometimes you lose your song. Sometimes you lose your... I've there been times when I've lost my song. The Bible said he gave us songs in the night. But then there have been times when I've got up out of bed and went in the study to pray a little bit. Something burdened my heart. You know, I don't have any trouble going to sleep. I have problems sometimes staying asleep. Get up 2 o'clock, and if you just lay there in bed, you're going to look at the clock until 5 o'clock before you go back to bed again. Sometimes I just get up and go in the living room, get in my chair, uh, get my Bible, read, do whatever. But you know, sometimes you go in there and God just gives you a song back in the middle of your problems. He does that. I'll never forget, and I've mentioned this probably 20 times, the night we were in real trouble and we lay in bed and God told me, trust me. I'll never forget. It wasn't an audible voice. I heard his punctuation. And I, I re, re, just rolled over and shook Barbara's shoulder and I told her it's going to be all right. God, God's going to take care of this thing and God did take care of that thing. But I thought about God gave him his song back. Listen, don't lose your song. The joy of the Lord is what? It's your strength. Rejoicing in the Lord. What? All way. And again, I say rejoice. Sometimes we lose our song. If you're in trouble, get your song back. Learn to sing. You say, I can't sing. Go outside and sing to the squirrels. They'll get up in the tree and fuss at you. You run the deer off. You run everything off. Just get up. Hey, sometimes sing. Don't sing in the shower. I, I, I don't know what it is about singing in the rain. I'm not big on that. But a lot of times I'll just sing. I make up songs. Boy, I wish I'd write, written them down. They rhyme. They sound good. And five minutes later, I can't remember what they were. But I'm talking about in the middle of troubles, while you're writing it out, don't lose your song. Keep a song in your heart. Keep that rejoicing in your heart in the things of God. And then in verse number 31 through 33, we find David's sacrifice re-offered. He said in verse number 31, This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. His sacrifice was one of thanksgiving in verse number 30. But he went on and said, And your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and the earth praise him and the seas and everything that moveth therein. Keep your worship. Just spend time thanking God. Listen, you can always find something to thank God for. That's why he said in everything, not for everything. There's some things that I hate. There's some things I don't think should have been done. Some things I, I don't think they still ought to be doing them. I, uh, we live with that. That's not, a, that's not a big deal with me and my praying. I pray about it. I ask God for the justice of God. I put it in His hand and tell Him if it's not in my lifetime, then let it be in theirs. But we find in here that His sacrifice offered back to God. He returned to the worship of the one who saved Him a long time ago. And then in verses 34 through 6, we find the surety of his outcome. 
Let the heaven and the earth praise him and the seas and everything that moveth therein, for God will save Zion. I want to tell Israel tonight, God will save Zion. God will save them over there. He moved them over there for a reason. We're not going to have World War III. Don't worry about a nuclear war. That's not how God's going to end this thing. God's going to end it in His way and in His time. I don't worry about nuclear holocaust and all this type stuff over there. A lot of posturing going on. God is going to take care of things His way, not man's way. But listen to what He said. God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession. And in verse 36, the seed also of his servants shall inherit it. If you look over there tonight, God preserved Zion. He preserved Judah. And his seed is back to possessing it tonight in these end times. The Bible said, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Life's full of sorrows, but God's got some solutions. Not that they take care of all your problems, but it gives you a biblical way to handle your problems in a right way when they come. And when they come, if you don't handle your problems right, you're not going to come out right. You've got to learn to handle them in a biblical manner. Let God do His work. And you trust God with what you can't fix. Now, if you can fix it, Man said one time I could lay out in the middle of the road and God protect me if it's not my time to die. I said, foom, 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 foom. Sometimes God gives you the ability to fix some things in the right manner. So you need to be proactive in that area. You need to be able to take care of what you can take care of in a right manner. What you cannot take care of, then you have got to learn to trust God, put a song in your heart, a spring in your step, get up and go about your business and learn to wait on the Lord with a patience. And that's what David learned in his life. He said, I sink in deep mire in verse number two where there's no standing. He said, I'm weary of my crying in verse number three. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. And yet God gave him victory throughout it all. And David died in a good old age. It always thrills me and, and I hate it for David. I mean, but when I read the words, these be the last words of David. I go to the end of his life and he tells you what was recorded, the last words. Now I'm talking about biblically written down. I'm sure he had other conversations, but the last time that he spoke in a manner that God used and put in the Word of God, he used that wording, these be the last words of David. And he died an old man full of years, gathered to his people, and I think we'll see him one day, but you can trust what you've got in your hand. Learn to trust the Word of God. Spend time in it. And then one of these days, whatever you're in will come to pass, and you'll see God just work that thing out for you. Amen. Let's stand tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer. If you need to come tonight, you come. Life's got solved, but I'm glad the Word of God has solutions. A lot of verses tonight. And I just simply outlined them in a manner that I would hope would be of help to you. If you're in trouble, you just have to learn.